conditioning experiment, which is what a group of students tried to do, where yes. they, if the lecturer walked onto the right-hand side of the room, they'd be really noisy and <gasps> loud, but if there was left side, they'd be really obedient, and so gradually he just wouldn't go into the right-hand side of the room. Did everyone hear what Liam just said? They were trying to train a lecturer and every time he did something, walk one way or another, they misbehaved and when he did the other thing, walk to the other side, they behaved. And without him knowing it, slowly then the lecturer was conditioned to uh, do that. That is awesome. I am so impressed by that. The other thing I heard once someone did to a lecturer uh, is my maths teacher told me this. I don't know if it's true or not. When he was a student, they, um, well, the electrical engineers uh, attached a potentiometer to the um, power supply going to a clock, or somehow were able to vary the clock speed in the lecture theatre. <laughs> <laughs> and they took the second hand off, so it wasn't obvious. And they ran the clock really fast for the first half. Uh, you know, so the guy's freaking out because the lecture's nearly over and he's only covered the first half. And then they ran it really slowly for the last 10 minutes. <laughs> That's awesome. So I'm disappointed you guys haven't done that yet. So Now we've got lots to do today, so um, let's jump right into it. Now, but today's lecture, I've got to say, is an easy one. It's not a hard one. I'm not going to do any Java or any theory or anything like that. We're just talking about some ideas that I've been meaning to talk about since 1927. We never quite had the time then. And this is, I'm hoping, a nice quiet week for you because you're working so hard on your project. I don't want to overload you with heavy conceptual ideas. We'll return to thinking of heavy conceptual ideas um, next week. So uh, what, we're going to, but what we're talking about now is, I think, still very, very interesting. And it goes to the um, core, the nature of this course. Do you remember, I finished yesterday's lecture listening, we were listening to Jackson play that music and we looked at a little fragment of it when he was playing it and he was really happy. Do you remember that? And I said that looking at him, I felt this enormous empathy, though I can't play guitar like that. I can't play guitar full stop. <laughs> or like that. Um, because he was obviously just in the zone. He was just enjoying it. He was you know, I mean, it was just an exhilarating, creative moment for him. It was just fantastic. And I said, that reminds me of how I feel when I program. And that's what I want to talk about now, about feelings. Because we never talk about feelings. Because we're engineers, mathematicians, computer scientists. It does not compute, OK? <laughs> but actually, it's sort of relevant to this course. So because I'm, I'm tight for time, I'm actually going to consult my notes so I don't ramble around as much as I normally do or I don't appear to. All right, this is it. The world is divided. One way of dividing sort of concepts in the world is between qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative is, what's qualitative? Qualitative. It involves the word quality. What does it mean? If I say that's a qualitative thing, what am I saying? It's categories. Oh, no, no, quality. You're the thing of quantitative. So quantitative, think. Like yeah, quanti by quantitative, I want to measure. Oh, yeah, I think you're thinking in stats. Sometimes they do category-based thing. OK, you know, I'm going to call both of those things quantitative. I'm going to say, if you can measure something, even if the measurement is only used to crudely classify it into one of three groups, or if the measurement's to give it an integer between one and a million or whatever, if you can somehow measure, weigh up, taste, feel, cut, classify, chop up, dice, dissect, and compare, I'm going to say that's quantitative. And I'm reserving qualitative for everything else. Um, there's an awesome book about this, actually, called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, where he talks about this uh, crazy idea of the difference between quality and quantity. And it's a crazy idea for us because we're used to quantitative things. And I think we're all most comfortable when we're dealing with quantitative things, things we can measure and assess and so on. Because we're engineers. What do we think when someone does something qualitative? When someone's talking about, oh, I don't know, they're talking about postmodernism. <laughs> they just talk and talk and talk and they're talking about Derrida and all this stuff. And we're just, what are we thinking? Asleep. Asleep. Yeah, we're thinking, don't understand, doesn't make sense. And we're suspecting the emperor has no clothes, aren't we? We're suspecting, you're talking crap. Not you, but yeah, yeah, the person talking, <laughs> you don't know anything. It's, you, you can't measure that. What do you mean? Okay. So have you noticed for every week now, since we first started talking about bad poetry at the start of the course, I've been trying to put up poems or pieces of literature at the start of each lecture. And some of them are amazing, and some of them are crap. And in fact, this week's one, though you can't see it now, I've got, I'll put it up during the break. I've got two things. They both talk about love. 
One of them is quite amazing, I think, and the other one is crap. And my challenge for you is could you write a computer program to detect the difference between a good poem and a bad poem? <laughs> I was going to pick some Shakespeare versus something else, and I figured, oh, actually, you could look for Shakespearean words and things like that, and you could sort of detect it. So then I was trying to rewrite a bad crap thing into Shakespearean verse, so it was still <laughs> crap. I was doing uh, uh, one of the Beatles songs. Ooh, I love the Beatles, but some of their lyrics sometimes aren't, uh, aren't p true poetry. It was something like, uh, love, love me do, you know I love you, I'll always be true, so please love me do. And I was trying to write that in Shakespearean words, and then we're going to put that versus some Shakespeare. And I was going to challenge you to see if you could, I didn't do it, but I was, I was just thinking about it, it was an exciting idea. But I was going to challenge you to write a program to tell the difference between the two. Because that's qualitative. If we could measure the difference between the two, I'm going to say that's quantitative. And there's this tension between them. I'm going to call something, I'm going to, I have this QQQ that I always think of. This is how I think about qualitative, quantitative. I always think that, uh, let's look, for example, at programming. Okay. There are quantitative and qualitative things about programming. What's a quantitative thing about programming? Speed. The speed of the code. You can measure that. The classification into algorithmic complexity classes. You can measure that. Number of lines of code. You can measure that. Certain um, comprehensibility measures you can measure. Complying with a style guide you can measure. You can detect if they're using patterns. If I come up with a style guide and you fail the style, why do I like having a style guide? But, oh, and, but the other thing is, when I write a program also it can be qualitative. There are just this vibe, that's a good program, that's a bad program. Sometimes it's hard to put your finger on what makes it good or what makes it bad. But you know from looking at it, it's good or bad. Now we give you a style guide in the course. Does that, what does that do? What's the point of having a style guide? We're doing some, we're sort of putting some quantitative thing on. We're going to measure your code in some way. In fact, we even have a program, though I've never used it, that checks if your code literally complies with the style guide. Cameron Stone wrote it. I used it in the first year he wrote it, but it was so depressing because no one's code at all complied with the style guide, even mine. Uh, <laughs> so I thought it was too ruthless. But, you know, if I did it ruthlessly from the very first lecture for every single piece of assigned code, I guess by now you'd have been trained to exactly follow the style guide. Why do you think we have the style guide, though? What's the point of it? Yeah. What do you mean readability? When you look at the code, you can tell. If, if code follows, now, is it the case that if code follows a style guide, it's readable? No. no. So it doesn't guarantee readability, but we still have it. I mean, you're on the right track, but let's just tease this idea out. Can you see, you can, everyone can imagine you could follow the style guide perfectly, and your code could still be a mess. Incomprehensible. You could write obfuscated code that complied with the style guide. So what's the point of the style guide? Let's just... Unreadable. Oh, yeah, Chen sort of going to think. In a sense, the style guide really isn't there to guarantee things are good, but the things it knocks out are generally bad. So complying with the style guide doesn't make your code magnificent, but not complying with it would generally probably, it, it knocks out a whole lot of crap code. But you can see it's not a perfect match, because you could write some brilliant code that doesn't happen to comply with the style code, and we've knocked that out, and you can get around the style guide. But, can you see you can fail in two different ways once you have a measure? You can fail because your thing's worse and you can fail because your thing's better. And, and failing when it's better is you prevent something good happening. That's a, that's a failure. If the style guide stops something amazing happening, that would be a terrible failure. And if the style guide prevents something terrible, uh, allows something terrible to happen, that would be another failure. So that's why we have this little sort of caveat on the style guide that says, you can break the style guide if you've got good reasons and if your code's generally clear and so on, so on, so on. Because we're not trying to knock out the thing. Now, I think when you're a manager, you often like quantitative things for this same reason. They knock out some of the bad stuff. So, for example, um, I might, as a manager, say, I want you guys to all write 100 lines of code a day. Well, that'd be all right, wouldn't it? That, can you see that doesn't guarantee you're going to write 100 good lines, but what's it knocking out? It's knocking out lazy, hopeless people who don't write any code. So it's just trying to get rid of some of the bad cases. Now, what if I said in an environment, I started noticing some people were being slack and they were writing more than 100 lines of code, but the code wasn't very good because it contained lots of duplication and things. So, or cop they just copied code from Google code and just pasted it in. So suppose we then brought in a rule saying, 
you can't have too much duplication, you've got to write 100 lines of code, and you can't copy code from Google code, the Google code bank sort of thing. That's getting rid of that problem, but what do you think of that new rule? It doesn't ensure quality, you can still write crap code that complies with that, and at the other end, it might stop some really good things happening. There might be, you know, the perfect thing might be literally taking a few lines of code out of programming pearls and seeking here, and that might be the best solution. This might prevent it. So I think managers tend to be given, uh, there's two worries. There's, there's two worries. Something, something wonderful doesn't happen. Something bad does happen. Now, I think this comes down to a lot of the difference between managers and leadership. I think managers are really normally only concerned with one of these things. Would you agree with that? In your exposure to managers and bureaucracies and things. The predominant concern is usually they're just trying to make sure that something bad doesn't happen. And often a lot of quantitative measures and, and things will be put into place to stop something really terrible happening. Even though naturally as a consequence of that happening, it will sometimes prevent something wonderful from happening. But actually that doesn't seem such a bad thing if something wonderful doesn't happen. I think to some managers, they're more concerned that if something bad does happen. Maybe it's just who gets in trouble if something bad happens, the manager does. Who notices if something wonderful doesn't happen? No one, because it was something wonderful, it would have been a surprise and it doesn't happen and you know, that's just grey, we don't mind sort of thing. So I think with, um, with poems, for example, if we were writing poetry, suppose you wanted to do something crazy and no one understood it, John. You wanted to do something, you said, I'm going to write all my poems in all my programs now in pentamic, penta iambic pentameter or something like that. You're going to do something crazy like that. And we're all a bit nervous about it. <laughs> we're thinking, we're paying this guy and now all his programs read like Macbeth. Or, 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 or and I, no, I won't even have a programming example. What if it's painting? So we're, we're looking at painting. You've got someone who's painting something, and it's crazy. It's someone new. It's, it's Marguerite or something like that. He's doing some painting, and it's a time when we haven't yet realized, although I think he was famous in his own life. Maybe it's someone who wasn't Van Gogh or some, I don't know, art history. Someone that wasn't, and they're painting something, and it looks different to everything else, and we think it's crap. Does that make sense? How could you tell that if it was crap or good? It's very, very hard. And if you wanted to stop crap paintings happening, you'd probably put a whole lot of measures in if you're employing this guy to say, it's got to look a lot like similar paintings. Your current painting looks different to similar paintings. I don't like that. And we'd sort of try and rule out a whole lot of things. And your painting has to be this size, because this is the size that sells best. And we'd start putting all these quantitative measurable things in to force the thing to be measured. And in doing that, Van Gogh would no longer be able to paint his brilliant paintings because they'd fall outside and we'd lose the magnificence of Van Gogh. So the, this thing that I keep saying, I keep trying to say it in different ways, I think of it as QQQ. I think of it as there's qualitative, there's quant, and there's qual. And this is the goodness sort of thing. And I think if someone's talking crap, if someone really just likes qualitative things, and they don't like quantitative things, and they don't like being measured or assessed, and they say, I'm an artist, if you measure and you and assess me, you're not going to capture the beauty of my work, they could be completely crap. And if you measure them, you'd, if you impose measures on them and things, you could rule out that sort of crapness, but actually they could be really fantastic, and if you put measures on, you might stop it happening. And unfortunately, it's very hard to write a program or for us to even assess what's good and what's bad. And why I want to talk about this particular thing now, this sort of way of thinking of things, I think of it as QQQ. I think of it as you have quantitative things as a sort of safe ground. If you don't have quantitative measures, then you could get stuff that's crap. Someone that just produces qualitative stuff and, they, and it's just crap and you wouldn't know. But if you have lots of qualitative measures, you're going to rule out lots of beautiful qualitative things that are magnificent. And I think of it in terms of design patterns, for example. I see this all the time. When someone comes along and they start gibbering on and on about design patterns, there's two things that could be happening. One is they could be an incompetent non-programmer and know nothing and they could be hiding behind design patterns. And they could be all down here. 
And as engineers, we hate that and we're itchy. We're going, that guy can't even code. Show me your code, man. Show me what you're going to do with this. This is a mess. You're just talking this crap. You're the guys on the hill. It doesn't make any sense what you're coming up with. It can't be implemented. It can't be done. But if we reject all the things that we don't really understand and that can't be measured and da, 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 and we only go for quantitative things, then we miss the magnificent things. So I think design is like this, for example. For us in design, I think it's really important to think about qualitative things because we do want to have beautiful and magnificent designs. And these are things that can't be measured or assessed in any way at all. And if we don't even contemplate that, if we don't start talking about beauty and magnificence in our designs, then we'll just produce grey code and it'll be crap. But at the same time, we have to be really wary that if someone's talking about things that can't be measured or assessed or things like that, there's a chance that they're just talking out of their bum and the thing's complete crap and it doesn't make any sense at all and they're just producing rubbish. And this is our tension. So I think of it as a QQQ thing. I see it happening at uni all the time, for example. Um, uh, I'm constantly being told things like, all lecturers must have a course outline that complies with this template. And my course outline doesn't comply with the template. Now, I can see why they want all lecturers to have a course outline that complies with the template. Because now then they can count the number of schools that have template measures and they actually they do produce statistics for each faculty of how many complying and non-complying um, uh, course outlines there are and they chart it over time to say your faculty's improving and your faculty's not so good. And they add all the numbers together and get a measure of the quality of the education we're giving to the students because one of the factors of having a good education is you've got to have a good outline. And I can see why they're doing it because some people hypothetically could be really slack and lazy and horrible and hopeless and not have a decent outline because they don't give a damn and they haven't thought about the course at all and they haven't planned the course and they haven't prepared the course and they can't articulate what the course is about because they haven't thought about what the course is about. And they don't tell the students any dates and then they change the dates all the time and like Thurston does and things like that. <laughs> and that's a terrible thing. And once you say everyone has to comply with the template, well, you've ruled all that out. You can't have those terrible things happening anymore. But unfortunately, at the same time, those templates read like cardboard and they don't talk about any of the interesting things and they don't allow you to do the exciting things. So they're ruling out a whole lot of blue sky at the same time. So I just defiantly don't comply with it. And somewhere I'm a black dot every year for not complying with that. And then. Uh, what's another, can you see the sort of thing I'm talking about here? So does that sort of make sense? That's a good to have a concrete example. Isn't it? Uh, NAPLAN, this test that all the kids at school are sitting at the moment to measure and assess them. You can see why parents want their kids to all be measured and assessed by a national standard thing. Because what are parents slash managers afraid of? <laughs> what's their biggest fear? Yeah, they're afraid of that something bad's happening, that, the, that there are crap teachers at the school and they're not teaching the kids anything and the whole thing's a mess and a shambles and a fiasco. And having this test means you can measure the schools and you can check if your school's really crap and a really crap teacher will be detected and kids that aren't learning anything at all will be detected. So it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah? Have the same with tests? You have the same problem with Roma acceptance tests? Yeah. Like no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we've got, because notice how we're assessing Roma. That's exactly right. We have quantitative testing, so you have to pass the test. But where are most of your marks coming from? The design process, the playing thing next week, where you're all looking at each other's code and playing the games, and you're all saying things like, I loved your one. It was fantastic. It was just so cool. Yeah, it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't thinking, what's that? But then the exam depends on the acceptance. So the exam is a pass-fail thing, but that's only one part of the exam. And then the rest, yeah, so we'll talk about exams in a sec. I mean, this is the whole thing about exams. But can you see I'm trying to give many marks for qualitative things for your assignment. I'd be really happy if you learned about, I don't know, dependency injection and you do wonderful sort of uh, networky stuff on your assignment. And then someone else is going to do some awesome graphics and someone else is going to think about playability and someone else is going to think about, you know, all these other exciting ways of changing the game, game design and things. You're all doing different things. They're very hard to measure. And if I tried to measure them, I'd cut it off. Yeah, I'd stop you being able to do those amazing things. So I like having that component in the assignment, but I've also got to have the other thing because I don't want to let someone through the course that can't program. I'm, I'm frightened of both of these things, yeah? So, yeah, yeah. But so the thing with NAPLAN is we have this test, and because of this test, the parents can check that their school isn't terrible. So they're, secretly, I think they don't trust the teachers. They're afraid that the teachers are horrible. But what's the consequence of having the NAPLAN test? Brazil. Oh, tell me about, oh, as in the movie Brazil. <laughs> yeah. Or England. Is anyone here from England? 
Because they started having this sort of thing a couple of years before we did. I mean, she started looking at schools to send them to, primary schools. She wrote back bragging about how amazing England was and how <laughs> advanced they were. Because in Australia, it's very hard to find a good school. Yeah, she's afraid she'll send them to a bad school. It's very hard to find a good school in Australia, but in England it's really easy because all everyone does is standardised tests and all the results are published publicly. So looking at the numbers, you can see which are the best schools. And she was saying, that's fantastic. It's giving me all this information. It's fantastic. And that's what she thought for about six months. And she got her kids into the best school, the ones with the highest scores. And then one of her kids started having troubles at school. Wasn't doing so well. So what do you think the school tried to do? kick him out of the school. Because the school had stopped caring about the qualitative thing. What do we want out of school? We want our kids to be educated and become inspired and wonderful and able to deal with the world and all these things that you can't really measure. Except at the end of their life, I guess you could ask them, was your school good? And they'll look back and only then they'll know if it was any good or not. You can't measure that. But you can measure if they know how to do this particular sort of division with carrying sort of thing. So we can only measure the things we can measure. We're missing the main things. So if someone starts not living up to the measure, then you've got this tendency to want to improve the measure. So yeah, yeah, you'll kick them out of the school. Uh, so that was horrendous. But it's even simpler than that. It doesn't have to be kicking them out of the school. It can be, what does the teacher teach? The teacher has half an hour. The sun's shining outside. There's a rainbow forming. It's just rain. The teacher's thinking, this is a great time to teach them about three-dimensional platonic solids bending of light, some famous science history, and we can also sing some beautiful songs like Louis Armstrong's It's a Wonderful World, and they can learn all about jazz and stuff like that. And then they think, oh, hang on, none of those things are in the NAPLAN test. Oh, I can't waste any time on that, because I've got to teach them how to do the trigonometric identity of some particular bizarre thing that they'll never ever need to know, but it happens to be in the test. So, I have to. so people start changing the syllabus to the test and people start coaching to the test. So no longer is the test actually measuring how good the school's going now, it's measuring how many coaching sessions you've been to, which is independent of the school. And if your teachers cheat, because some teachers, have you seen in the news, are cheating now, getting the results and trying. It's measuring a whole range of other things. It's not measuring the qual qualitative things that we're hoping for, it's just measuring what it can measure and what it can measure. I think it was Einstein. Was it Einstein that says it? Someone who can search. He said something awesome like, not everything that's wonderful can be measured, and not everything that can be measured is worth measuring. Something like that. Like, there's this sort of disconnect. What we're really interested in as a programmer is we want to have that feeling, the Jackson feeling. We want to have a great life, the Jackson feeling. We want to do inspiring things. We want to have a great job where we're stimulated. We want to help the world. We have all these things we want. Maybe we just want money. I don't know what it is, but whatever it is, you can't measure any of those things. Yeah, your ability to get promoted and earn lots of money, you can't even measure that except after the fact, looking to see if you did get promoted. Because maybe you need to be really greedy and really selfish and really mean, and you can't measure those things really reliably or something. Or maybe you just need to be inspired or a creative or entrepreneur. You can't measure those things either. So the things we really want out of life, we can't measure. If we concentrate too much on the things we can measure, then we'll lose them. But if we don't concentrate them on them at all, then we could just do complete crap. A lecturer could stand up and talk for half a lecture on something that wasn't even about OO. <laughs> and just completely waste our time and no one would ever know or be able to see. So we have to have at the end some sort of way of checking that terrible things aren't happening. But if we focus on that too much, that's all we'll get. A world in which nothing terrible happens. Who wants to live in that world? That's like a grey world where everything's just average. I want to live in a world of rainbows and explosions and fantastic <laughs> things and playing the guitar and awesome stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I reckon if you think back over your own education actually and you think about the best things that happened to you at high school, the best teachers you had, the best things you learned, the times you changed the most, the times you developed as a person the most, the times you just were inspired. I'm, I'd be prepared to bet this piece of chalk that not one of those things could possibly be on the NAPLAN test that they're sitting at the moment. Measured, it couldn't even be measured at all probably. And a system that just focuses on NAPLAN like we're doing more and more all the time now is going to, there's no incentive for the teachers to teach that stuff. All the incentive is, we've got to practice our divisions again today, guys, because that's in NAPLAN. We've got to practice our vowels again today, because that's in NAPLAN. Hmm. OK. I didn't mean to talk about NAPLAN a lot. It just was, I just wanted another concrete example. OK, so um, and we, now we hinted at this sort of thing when we were in 1927. We talked a bit about Lord Kelvin. Remember that guy who started measuring everything? And he said something like, if it can't be measured, it doesn't count sort of thing. And we sort of made slight fun of him. But also, he was really awesome because measuring things is really useful. As scientists and engineers, if we can't measure things, then 
we can't do the things that we're really good at doing, which is abstracting, noticing that two things are really the same except for some irrelevant properties. We need to know they're the same, we need to be able to measure and check they're the same. So you're both mammals. <laughs> We can know that because we've got a way of classifying and working out mammals. But not only that, you're both homo sapiens. And we know that because we've got ways of detecting if people are homo sapiens. Okay? Well, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I don't know. Are you? Yeah, I reckon you are. I reckon you are. Um, so uh, it's actually really important to measure and classify and quantify. And that's sort of how science progresses, isn't it? If we just thought everything was wonderful and rainbows, we wouldn't be able to combine chemicals and do things. We had to actually notice that all these chemicals, even though they look different, were essentially the same, and when mixed in certain proportions, the same reactions happened and so on, and then we got an indication about how electrons, rings formed and things. This is all happening from measuring, and, and progress comes from this. Progress in science and ideas comes from this. So I don't think we should uh, run away from it, but actually I don't think we have any danger of that, because if you're like me and you're all engineers and geeks, that really is all we think about and value and care about. And I'm sort of suggesting that let's not focus on that completely or, or we'll stuff up here. Okay. So uh, do you remember in uh, 1927 and in 1911, we talked a lot about the difference between intentional and extensional. And we sort of ended up with this sort of approach where we said all that really counts when you're doing a design is the extension. And that gives us abstraction and that lets us design this complex system. So we really love the difference between intentional and extensional. But if you think about it, what we're really saying there, extensional is the stuff you can measure, and intentional is you know, the soul, the spirit. And we're essentially saying, you know, as a design principle, let's not think about that, let's just think about the extension. So we certainly do love this idea of quantifica quantification and measuring and assessing and classifying. It's really important in computing, but I'm just saying we can't go completely that way, or, um, or we're stuffed, I think. We'll, 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 not, we'll not be able to tell the difference between um, Love, Love Me Do and uh, Shakespeare. Even though, actually, you might, love, love me, you might like Love, Love Me Do more than Shakespeare. But I'm talking about it as a poem. I shouldn't have picked about something that as a poem sucks, but as a piece of music is quite good. I should have picked something that sucked in all dimensions, shouldn't I? Oh, there's Mike. Hi, Mike. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I think probably the last thing I wanted to talk about, just as an example of this, was the whole sort of thing as, as we were moving into the Enlightenment, this whole thing about clouds, that I guess in our own lives and probably in their lives up till then, everyone looks at clouds and thinks they are a sort of a qualitative thing, they're ephemeral, you can't capture them, they're never the same two seconds in a row, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is no notion of anything quantitative about them, they're qualitative. But actually, this really clever guy, whose name I've forgotten, but I read it in a book by Richard Hamblin, <coughs> thought, well, actually, I've noticed that clouds fall in distinct categories. And we have ones that look like this and ones that look like this. And he came up with five or six categories, including cumulonimbus and cumulo and strata nimbus and strata castor and all that sort of stuff. And they noticed that the different sorts of clouds indicated different things. And that actually told us a lot about the atmosphere and things like that. So sometimes even things that appear by their nature utterly and immeasurably qualitative can be quantified. And when that happens, I think that's a really important and valuable thing to do. And if you notice, that's exactly what we're doing in this course with design patterns. We're trying to grab this thing that's really ephemeral, like what your code looks like when you've got a whole lot of it. And we're trying to say, actually, what you're doing there with your code is exactly the same as what you're doing there with your code, even though they're written in different languages, they're solving different problems, the lines are different. There's no commonality in the lines at all, but you're both using the template method. Yeah, yeah? So it's this idea that we're trying to classify because that gives us an incredible advantage in that lessons we learn from dealing with your approach, we can now apply to your approach. And we can share ideas and build on and this whole thing of building on each other. So, so in a sense, I think we should always strive to quantify everything, but I'd like to think we live in a world where not everything is quantifiable. I'd like to think that there's some quali quali qualitative things that we can never measure, assess, or anything. But at, at the same time, simultaneously, I'd really like to think that we're working as hard as we can to prove that's wrong. <laughs> You know, that's sort of the struggle of man. Now, Mike, who just walked in then, will be talking in the extension lecture about a branch of maths called category theory, which does exactly that. Exactly what design patterns do in computing, it does in maths. Where are you, Mike? Which is, we find a problem in one domain of mathematics, and say, something that happens in a completely different branch of mathematics, it looks nothing like it at all, 
but we step back and say, but actually they're the same. And once we've noticed they're the same, it's really useful because then maybe there's some interesting results or proofs that we've noticed in your area. We can lift them up and they can now apply to your area and we don't have to actually rediscover those proofs in, the new, in, the, in your context. We just know it. And that lets us think about what's going on at an even higher and more abstract level. And when you see it, it's very, very beautiful. And I think, would you agree? It's very, very beautiful. Makes your toes curl. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> no, because actually I've missed a whole lot of what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> okay, all right. And now, how are we going for time? All right. Uh, John want, John's going to say something. Yep. Um, but John, can I go for just five minutes more? Yep, sure. Yeah, and then you'll go for 10 minutes. Then we'll take a five minute break and then you'll go. And are you thinking you'll go for about 50 minutes or, or even less, possibly 40? Yeah. The second. Um, thing I wanted to talk about was not just QQQ. Oh, which reminds me, by the way, there is this awesome thing in the Avengers where they talk about QQF, which is this society that exists to make life, people's lives quite, quite fantastic. <laughs> it's a company called Quite, Quite Fantastic. And I keep hoping they'll actually get listed on the stock exchange. Uh, and it's entirely about quantitative, or qualitative things. But uh, I'll leave that as homework for you to watch the Avengers and find out about that. The other thing I wanted to talk about was, it came up out of a, a comment that Theo made the other day, and then someone picked this up with Evan as Evan was leaving. Theo said, oh, where are you, Theo? After the lecture, he came up and said, when we were talking about this incremental design and our whole incremental approach to everything and how we build incrementally and we're hoping that we'll essentially, by hill climbing, converge on a really nice design. And Theo said, but hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I remember back in... 1927 at the start, when you started teaching us about sorting algorithms, you said, don't read any sorting algorithms, don't look anything up, go home this weekend when you're in this newborn state where you don't know any sorting algorithms and try and work out as many ways of sorting as you can because next week I'm going to start teaching you sorting algorithms and once you see them it will channel the way you think and it'll be really really hard for you to think of new ways and think about sorting because you'll be locked into the ways that we suggest and there could be all these brilliant new ideas that you could come up with sorting on your own. Do you remember that? And Theo said, doesn't this sort of go against what you're talking now about this hill climbing iterative building on the shoulders of those that have come before us sort of approach? Because you're sort of saying, don't do that. Go away and do something else. And, and this is a really important point. And the same point came up with Evan when he was talking about design. And someone said to him, what do you think of, this was in the private conversation at the end, so only a few of you heard this. What do you think of Google's approach when they wanted to know what color blue to use so they surveyed 50,000 million people with blues that were one apart on the color spectrum. And they just did this enormous statistical analysis and eventually picked this shade out of 500 almost exactly identical shades of blue to use. And they did all these elaborate tests and things. And Evan said then, I think that is complete rubbish. And not everything can be measured and assessed. And sometimes you don't want to do this little incremental thing where you think this blue's all right, but this blue's a little bit better, and this blue's a little, and you converge like that. Sometimes it takes a leap, and you have to say, actually, maybe it's green, or actually, maybe we don't have a color at all, or maybe whatever, I don't know. So this idea of jumping around. And that's sort of what I was asking you to do with sorting algorithms. Maybe you can jump somewhere completely new. Now, we'll see in two weeks' time, in our very last week, how hill climbing doesn't always lead to optimal solutions. It only does if your solution space is structured in a certain way that always going up will eventually get you to the highest peak. And how, like the tallest guy example we used. Remember when we introduced hill climbing? How often does it actually happen that the search base is structured so a hill climb will work? I reckon in the real world, hardly ever. So incremental design is good, and slow converging is good, and will give you something better than you have at the moment. But absolutely, I think to find a brilliant design that needs to be combined with creative leaps. Now, in this is why, do you remember when I started talking about all the stuff about refactoring and the X, uh, XP sort of approach to design and things like that. I was saying it looks fantastic, but I have a few slight reservations. My reservations are it's essentially just going to be doing hill climbing. And I think sometimes iteratively converging on the optimal design won't, on a good design, won't give you the best design. You might need to just grab the bin, throw everything away, rustle through, and find the picture of the opera house. The crazy thing that's not like anything else that anyone's ever seen before. So I think a real design involves both. But the reason we're stressing XP in this course is because I know XP works. And I think probably your biggest problem isn't that you're not able to come up with a brilliant design. It's that you're not able to come up with a brilliant design on time. 
So I'd rather you come up with an okay design on time than a brilliant design late, when late means forget it, it's irrelevant. Nonetheless, I hope we don't all just become little pen pushing, incremental, weasley little 10% improvers. I hope we still remember this jumping around like crazy sort of thing, because I think um, ultimately that's what's going to give us our brilliant solutions. Uh, and I had two, um, just following our historical theme, there's sort of two political approaches to change. When your government sucks and you're completely oppressed and nothing's working out, and someone at the top's getting really rich or building an enormously large pyramid, and you're not getting any sleep and your back's sore, or they're building a cathedral, or they're building a palace, or they're, they're, they're fiddling. <laughs> and the two approaches are sudden revolution or incremental social change. And over history, we've seen lots of these happening all the time. And now as we're coming uh, into the Enlightenment, lo and behold, in France, they're so annoyed with the king that they decide to go for the revolution. But over in England, they decide to go for the incremental change. Which is best, which is worse? Gandhi went for the incremental change. Over in Thailand now, they're trying for the revolution. Nick Clegg just got elected in England. He was saying, I heard a quote from him, this is not time for gradual change, we're going to change everything. Whether he does or not, I don't know, but it sounded exciting. It certainly got my blood pumping. But is that best? Do we like incremental change? Do we like big change? It's the same as in computing. The dangers of a big change are it's scary. It might fail completely, as revolutions often do. And the dangers of incremental change is you just might never get there in your own little weaselly, pathetic way. You might need to actually break free and break through the whole thing. OK. So we'll be talking a bit about that next week. Um, yeah, I don't think I have to say any more about that. Oh, yeah, except in science, in development of ideas in science, we have the same thing. The idea that, suppose we're in some field, what is it? The field that measures, you can work out a lot of someone's personality by just measuring their head and feeling the bumps on their head. I think it's called phrenology, is that what it's called? Yeah, and there were papers, so I'm not actually going to fill your head, but it looks very interesting there. I'm thinking I could find out a lot about you. And there were lots of papers written about it, and people wrote theses on it, and they cited each other, and they got promoted based on it, and the ideas slowly got better and better, and they kept converging gradually, until suddenly there was a big shift, and someone said, hang on, that's a pile of rubbish. And the idea was thrown away. And it's the same thing that happened with the theories of light traveling through the ether, that there's, a, there's this invisible, unmeasurable gas everywhere, because light's a wave, and something has to be waving, you have to be in a medium and all sorts of other ideas in physics and things like that, that we slowly improve and improve and improve, but eventually we climb to the top of the hill, but it's not the biggest hill. We improve and improve the idea, but it's still wrong, and, and we have to do a massive change. And in science, this happens all the time. We see this pattern over and over again, that the 10% has come along, slowly improving things, but every now and then we realize something's rubbish and we have to throw it out and start again, and that's called a paradigm shift. And a famous science philosopher called Thomas Kuhn talks a lot about paradigm shifts, so you might want to think about that. So this same notion of incremental versus sudden pops up everywhere, whether you're designing a society or a program or a theory in science or something like that. Now, John has very kindly agreed to tell us all about a very exciting pattern. Yes, hopefully. Oh, okay, cool. Go. All right. Hi, I'm John. Yeah, yeah. Do you want the mic? You may remember me from lectures such as. <laughs> yeah, you may. Oh. Hello? Hello? Yep. Um, you may recognize me. I'm also the guy who never learned how to use Eclipse, <coughs> if you wanted to put a name to a face. <laughs> so, um, one of my favorite patterns is actually decorator. So, if you those who don't know what it is, you're in for a treat. You have chalk. Yes. So actually, apparently last week, Richard, you uh, showed them the Sterrance video, or was that on Tuesday? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, yeah. Yep. So if you remember with Sterrance, we had um, like an animal. And all these features we wanted to add to it, like claws, and uh, what was else? There was like uh, central locking, I think, or something. There was some car features coming in there. So we had this sort, of, this sort of base animal, and we would add all these features to it. So how would you guys go about doing that now? Like, if we gave you a Sterrance class, how would you go about doing it? Maybe if your first solution would be like to inherit. So you'd have your sort of base class, and you would extend it, and you'd have, you know, clawed Sterrance, then you'd have your horn Sterrance. Then what happens if you want clawed and horn Sterrance? And so you'd have to extend those, but then, oh no, hang on, you can't have multiple inheritance in Java. And so at the end, you had this huge mess. And for every class you wanted to do this for, you'd have to basically create 
all these other features. So the idea of a decorator class is you get given a class, you just add one feature to it. And what's really nice about it is that the new class you get is actually the same, it's implementing the same class that you originally had. So you can sort of transparently add more and more features. I kind of think of like, like a sort of like a double agent, sort of spy. So it's like, oh yeah, I'm, a, <coughs> I'm the Sterns class. They really I'm a Sterns class of corns, but they didn't know that. So like, <laughs> Sterns type. So um, I'll actually get code I can show if you want. Yeah. Yep, sure. Um, can you go to my homepage? Please? <laughs> Please, sir, come on. No. Yeah. If I can remember what I was saying. Yes, so, so it's sort of, so how do, so how do you do this sort of inheritance tree? The, the idea of the decorator is you give me some class and I decorate it with like one special ability. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you know, I, give you, I give you one superpower, but only one superpower only. But then the idea is that you have the more decorators you have, you can add, like you basically build up lots of features. What's nice about it is, say with the animal, if these were decorators, any animal you could apply these decorators to, not just this one. So if I had a second animal, instead of having to do the same extending mass we have before, and then trying to work out how I add two together, do I like inherit over here? I could just selectively, I could just reuse the decorators on this. So as an example, I created a shark interface. Sorry, my bad. Oh no, spoilers. We have our shark interface. And so this has, you know, a swim, like, and um, has an attack, so it's going to kill or attack, and you get damage points, so how many points it actually does when it attacks something. To say, so now we implement some, sh some sharks, we've got a great white, to make like a shh. Sort of noise. Oh, I lost the mic. Probably. It has. Sorry. It has. Um. So it has the attack. Om nom nom. Mm, victim and gives you back 100 damage points. And we also have the wobby gong, which I'm not sure if you guys know wobby gong. It's a pretty cool, harmless um, shark. So it just makes it sort of a, not very loud. Shh, and just gently gnawing on the victim. <laughs> There's actually a story I know where a guy thought his mate was tapping him on the shoulder, but he was actually being attacked by a wobby gong. <laughs> a violent shark attack ensued, he wasn't even aware. So like, mate, just stop it, anyway. So, right, so now we decide, you know, sharks are cool, but we can make sharks even cooler. We can add laser beams to sharks. So we create a shark with laser beams decorator. So we give it a shark, so if you notice, it implements a shark and also takes in the shark. That's the key of a decorator. It takes in some sort of interface and also implements that interface. So it takes in the shark, um, swim doesn't do anything, attack, charges its laser, fires the laser, attacks his victim and shoop to whoop. And of course, <laughs> you add 9,000 points because, you know, then it'll be like over 9,000. So to use this, we don't have to do any new, we don't have to create any new classes. We just basically create, so here's, a, here's something I prepared earlier. So here's, I create a new Wobby Gong. Uh, should I make it, should I actually run it? Yeah, go for it. We can have, the, do we have Putty, we have Putty. We have the power. Secret password. All right, cool. All right, so same files. Actually, let's like, this is with a decorator, but let's just remove the decorator so you get a better idea. There we go, beautiful. All the hacks we have. Um, ignore. Yep. Lights. Oh, how do I? Oh, so noob. Dim so down. 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 There we go. All right. So we create, we create a new wobby gong called Fred. We tell him to attack some small fish. Then we see how many damage points he did. Um, we create a new great white called Bob. He swims around a bit, then he decides to attack a seal, and then we see how many damage points he does. So this is like your existing, um, just a little simple sharky test. And we run it. Yay, no compile errors. I'm so pro. So the wobby gong was shh, then he gently gnaws on some small fish, does zero damage, oh, poor wobby gong. Then the great white does the shh, the faster swimming, om nom nom some seal, and does a higher damage. So now, no, I didn't background that, damn it. So now, we're just going to change it slightly, but instead of creating a new Wobby Gong and a new Great White, 
we're going to actually decorate them with the shark of laser beam. With laser beam decorator. So all we're doing is passing it in to, um, to passing in the existing shark to this decorator. And notice we don't actually have to change the variables at all because the decorator is actually a shark as well. So just change these two little lines. In fact, I'm changing them, changing them back to what they were. So I go back in time now, but it was saving time. Yeah, all right. So done that. Compile it. Ta-da! Run it. So now we can see that there's the same swimming, charges his laser, fires his laser, then it's small fish, shoop the whoop. And suddenly now Wobby Gong's gone from like harmless Wobby Gong to like 9,000 damage Wobby Gong, which that's a pretty impressive Wobby Gong. But so that's not something that, so we've instantly added a feature to the sharks and we haven't had to change the existing shark and we haven't really had to, we have to like minimally changed the code that uses the shark. It's very sort of, it's sort of a transparent, um, a, like you're transparently adding a feature. And what's the best part of this is I can now create, you know, all the sharks. I could implement all the sharks of the, of the world and the decorator would work magically as long as I didn't change the interface. Uh, and what's even better with decorators is you can add them on. I could, uh, if I had to create a second decorator like a racing, like racing red stripes shark, then, and which would maybe may swim faster, I'll just add that on top. And it doesn't really matter which order it does, shouldn't really matter which order I put them in. Both of them will be decorated and add all the features. Can you add multiple lasers? Yeah, you, I could. <laughs> 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 How many lasers do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, that new shark, new shark. Yeah, I know. Am I forgetting a bracket? No. Oh, wait. Oh, that one. No. <laughs> All right, so making like the super wobby gong. So I said they were harmless, but uh, <laughs> I don't think you'd want to. Um, uh, don't think you'd want to. That's all good now. All the matching things are doing. Should we leave the great white the same? Yeah, I did. Oh. oh no, you're right. No. All right, there we go. Awesome. All right, so now if we compile that, so now I'm a charge and I'm. <laughs> so we've got laser beam squared. What we going? So that I think. Look, and now it does. Fred does twenty-seven thousand damage points. So. It's kind of like you can just plug and play features, and what's, that's really nice. And um, I think out of all the patterns I've used, I think I've used decorators the most sort of in the in industry. So, in fact, uh, unfortunately, I wanted to do as an example um, for Design Three. You guys had uh, the reversing the sound, and a cool way of doing that would have been to actually create a decorator, just that, which just reverse the sound. So you would just to write a reverse file, you would just write it out normally. To play it, you just play it normally, but the decorator would actually handle the reversing. However, the audio file format wasn't an interface, it was a class, so it was going to be a bit messy, so I didn't want to do that. Um, you probably could have even done censoring, I guess, with a, a decorator, yeah, yeah, a censor decorator, which just sort of, you know, it would return the word, like return a page. You could have done. You could have done chess. You could have done chess, yep, piece. Oh, chess, is a, chess is a common one to do. Yeah, you could have done Enigma. Enigma, yep. Yeah, if you, also, if you, if you think of adapters, like an, a decorator is kind of an adapter that sort of. A, it's like an adapter, but to itself, but adds a feature. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoy decorators. They're Can cool. We all give John an enormous hand. Thank you.